My math says the Earth is teeny tiny and shaped like a pear, and at the top it has a succulent nipple. He actually believed that? Yes, I actually believe this. Do I actually have to talk about this? No, he didn't think that the world was shaped like a pear with a nipple on top. In fact, I had never even heard this claim before. Knowing better is not quite accurate in this regard, and the truth is much more strange than it sometimes is. Let's hear from Columbus himself, quote, I have always read that the world land and water was spherical, and authoritative accounts in the experiments which Ptolemy and all the others have recorded concerning this matter. So describe it and hold it to be by the eclipses of the moon, and by other demonstrations made from east to west, as well as from the elevation of the pole star from north to south. Now, as I have already said, I have seen so great irregularity that as a result I have been led to hold this concerning the world, and I find that it is not round as they describe it, but that it is the shape of a pear which is everywhere very round except where the stalk is, for there it is very prominent, or that it is like a very round ball, and on one part of it it is placed something like a woman's nipple, and that this part where this protuberance is found is the highest and nearest to the sky, and it is beneath the equinoctial line and in this ocean sea at the end of the east." Unquote. From this quote, you might think that Columbus believed that the earth was shaped like a pear with a nipple-like protuberance, but here is where it gets very weird. As Columbus states, quote, In that hemisphere, I do not question at all that it is spherical, rounded as they say, but I declare that this other hemisphere is as the half of a very round pear, which has a raised stalk, as I have said, or like a woman's nipple on a round ball. Unquote. So Columbus believed the Earth had a Frankenstein shape where the Western Hemisphere was shaped like half a pear with a nipple-like protuberance while the Eastern Hemisphere was spherical. This is the map Columbus was going by, made by Toscanelli in 1474. What annoyed me is that Knowing Better did not give a source for this map. I try to scour the internet to find the original source for this reconstruction to no avail. I did find the reconstruction in the reliable source known as Wikipedia, where the scholars of Wikipedia are trying to parade this reconstruction as the original map, as it's labeled just that in the Wikipedia page that features the reconstruction reposted in J.G. Bartholomew's 1911 book titled, quote, A Literary and Historical Atlas of America, unquote which the scholars of Wikipedia falsely put the date of the book as 1884. Whatever the source for this reconstruction, it's somewhat of an oddball among other reconstructions, as it uses the term Mod Oceanum, which was a general term used by the Greeks to describe the ocean sea. Well-recognized reconstructions labeled the Atlantic Ocean as Oceanus Accidentalis or Oceanus Orientalis, such as Wagner's and John Murray's slash Bartholomew's reconstructions. According to the online ephthalmology dictionary, subdivisions of the ocean began in the 14th century. Today, we'd subdivide the global ocean into five distinct regions. You would think that a mathematician who was acute to detail would have used a more specific word such as Oceanus Accidentalis and not a general term like Mod Oceanum, which raises the question, if there are more accurate reconstructions of Toscanelli's map, then why did knowing better not use one of those to introduce the map of Tuscanelli. He did use Murray's slash Bartholomew's reconstruction, but only to show the land masses of the continents of the Americas. I think Knowing Better got duped into thinking that this was the actual map of Tuscanelli. Whenever Adam says America, he's specifically referring to the United States, which is weird. Yes, it's weird, but that's no fault of theirs. It's a product of Americentrism. In the United States, you're raised with this notion that America is the name of the country you're born in, when in reality, that's the name of the region the country is located. Hence the name United States of America. 
granted, the United States does pose a problem for nation states that love to name their property, I mean citizens. What are people in the United States going to be called? United Statesians? I personally have a problem with people who say that the Vikings discovered America first. Imagine it's 2010 and someone offers to sell you Bitcoin at 10 cents a piece. You decline it because it's stupid and worthless. Now it's 2017 and Bitcoin is worth $10,000 a piece. So you go around telling everyone how you could have been rich because you knew about Bitcoin back in the day, but you never did anything with it. Okay, now swap out Bitcoin for America and extend the timeline out to 500 years. The Vikings didn't discover America first. They stumbled on it looking for timber, stayed for a year, and then left. I also have a problem with people saying that the Vikings discovered America first, but not for the reason you gave, but for the simple fact that there was a group of homo sapiens which discovered America before the existence of factors that caused Leif Erikson's mom to put it inside her vagina instead of her mouth. They're called the indigenous peoples of the Americas. So if you want to give credit to a group of people, why not give it to them? Why are you trying to take away their credit? Some of them did invent a wheel. They just didn't use them for hauling because they hadn't domesticated draft animals yet. I would have been fine with that statement until he said the word yet. This implies that given enough time, they would have eventually when, no, they wouldn't have. Ever. Not because they're intellectually inferior or anything like that, but because they had a really difficult spawn point. There are no draft animals or work or pack animals in the Americas. There are no horses, donkeys, or camels. And because of that, they hit somewhat of a cap on their civilization tech tree. You can't really have large cities without animals. I wondered when you'd get round to that one. That's simply false. You don't need beasts of burden to have large cities as this was proved thousands of years ago by the Aztecs. Thino Chichlin had an estimated population of 300,000 people in 1519, according to many contemporary scholars. That's bigger than many European cities that existed around the same time. For example, Paris had an estimated population of 200,000 people in 1500 and 300,000 people in the middle of the century. Assuming constant growth from 1500 to the middle of the 16th century, it would have had around 238,000 people in 1519. I don't know what a civilization tech tree is, but I do know that the Mayan civilization was one of the most advanced civilizations at its height. The Mayan city Caracol is one of the originators of sustainable cities which predates the popularization of the term in our modern day world. To put it in other words, the Mayans in Caracol were so advanced that a modern civilization thousands of years in the future is just getting up to speed on the concept of sustainable cities. So what does knowing better mean by a cap on their civilization tech tree? Did he expect the natives like the Mayans to have gone to the moon in 650 AD? Is creating an artificial soil in which modern society tries to pawn it off as their own an example of a cap on their civilization tech tree? Because the indigenous peoples of the Amazon created an artificial soil called Black Earth, which influenced biochar, a soil conditioner. Do the indigenous peoples from the Amazon get any remuneration for their invention? Most likely not. The people who are benefiting or are going to benefit from biochar are greedy capitalists. In fact, with the exception of llamas and guinea pigs in Peru, they didn't have any domestic animals. Is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? If the Native Americans did not have any domesticated animals except for llamas and guinea pigs in Peru, then what was Christopher Columbus talking about when he mentioned dogs of various colors on his second voyage? The Spaniards would eat these dogs and Oviedo even compared the taste of the dogs with kids. And what was Bernardino de Sagan talking about when he mentioned the Mexican hairless dogs and how the Aztecs would wrap them up in blankets at night to keep them warm? And what about the turkey? That didn't cross your mind? You forgot that the turkey was domesticated by Native Americans thousands of years ago? What, did you think that the pilgrims brought the turkey from Europe to the Americas? So on Columbus's second voyage, when smallpox was introduced to the New World, it burned through the entire continent, killing 90% of the Native American population before they had even heard of a European. <laughs> You 
serious? What? In Columbus's second voyage, smallpox killed 90% of the Native Americans? That's just false. In Elizabeth Abbott's book, Sugar, A Bittersweet History, she states that, quote, in 1518, smallpox wiped out 90% of Hispaniola's remaining Tainos. By the mid-century, they were extinct. In other colonies, up to 90% of the native population would disappear well before the 17th century. Noble David Cook in his book Born to Die stated that, quote, regions least affected by the disaster lost at least 80% of their people, 90% or more was more typical, and some regions became destitute. But that was a century after the first contact. So what the fuck are you talking about? 90% of Native Americans were wiped out by smallpox on Columbus's second voyage. The point is that by 1600, 90% of the Native population had died. So when the first North American colonists showed up in 1607 and 1620, they found most of the land to be pretty much uninhabited. Again, wrong. According to the U.S. National Library of Medicine, between 16 and 1700, 75% of the native peoples in Virginia died. It appears to me that the people are ingenious and would be good servants, and I am of the opinion that they would very readily become Christians, as they appear to have no religion. They very quickly learn such words as are spoken to them. In full context, the word servant could mean slave, or servant of God, or subject of the crown. When they just cut out the ingenious good servant part, it only means slave. They remove any context and any doubt. But these are Columbus's own words. We have to take them at face value since we can't figure out what he really meant. Right? Do you see where I'm going with this yet? These aren't his own words, because his real name wasn't Christopher Columbus, it was Cristoforo Colombo. Oh look, what do we have here? Yes, I really do have that kind of time on my hands. Today I got time, Chris! Here's what we're looking for from October 11, 1492. Now we have to translate it. Let's just shove it into Google Translate and see what we get. They must be good servants and of good wit that I see that very quickly he says everything he told them, blah blah. Obviously Google isn't the best translator since it doesn't carry meaning very well, but it takes some linguistic gymnastics to get from they must be good servants and of good wit to the people are ingenious and would be good servants. I'm confused. What's the difference between those translations? Ingenious and wit can be used interchangeably. I know for a fact that ingenio can be accurately translated into ingenious. But if you want, go to Google Translate and type exactly what he typed in. Highlight the word ingenio so you can see the frequency. The first word is wit and the second word is ingenuity and they have the same frequency. So how is that a linguistic jump? Are you trying to say that it's a linguistic jump because they use the phrase the people are instead of the phrase they must be? But those phrases are pretty much saying the same thing. If they must be good servants and of good wit, that means that they are good servants and of good wit or they have certain characteristics that makes the observer believe that to be true. If somebody stated that I said that the car was red, and I said no, I never said the car was red, I said that it must be red, they would look at me as if I was crazy. I really don't see the linguistic jump. I think knowing better is trying to muddy the waters to make two translations seem different when they're really not. They pick the absolute worst, most biased translation to quote as journal entries literally from him. Fun fact, the Italian translation of his journals don't have the word servant at all. Instead, they translate it as servant of God or... I'm not going to walk you through the process for every single quote, but there is another one people like to refer to. I could conquer the whole of them with 50 men and govern them as I please. Here's the Spanish and here's what Google Translate says. Because with 50 men they are all subjugated and it will make them do everything they want? Okay, that ending doesn't really make all that much sense, but I can tell you what it doesn't say. Conquer them and govern them as I please. Let's look at the second part. Your own source translates it into servants. Google translates it into servants. That's because servidores can be accurately translated into servants. So what's your problem again? The Italian translation? You have Columbus's writings right in front of your face. Why do you need a translation into another language that I assume is not your first language? Oh, because it doesn't use the word 
servant which seems to flare up your bias receptors and you continue using Google Translate even though you stated that Google Translate is flawed. Google isn't the best translator since it doesn't carry meaning very well. And Google Translate is not as accurate as a human translator. It defies logic. And Google Translate becomes even less accurate not because of the limits of its algorithm but because the copyist was uneducated so he makes a lot of errors. This is why you have scholarly translations which can take into account errors and can analyze the historical process of a word. And the Fordham translation and the translation from your source actually makes it seem less repugnant. Their translation says, quote, I could conquer. Could? In my translation, he says that with 50 men, we had them all subjugated. Not that he could have them subjugated or conquered. My translation in full is thus, quote, because with 50 men, we had them all subjugated and they would do whatever we wanted, unquote. If you have subjugated all of them, that's the same as having conquered them. And if they allowed you to do whatever you wanted to them, then you can govern them as you please. That's actually a good sense for sense translation of what Columbus said and does not misrepresent him. My only problem is that they use the word could. But just to be sure, let's look at a different translation of the same quote. For with 50 men they can all be subjugated and made to do what is required of them. The words conquer or govern don't appear here either. Again, they pick the worst possible translation to highlight. Again, in full context, in this section, Columbus is asking the king and queen what they want done with the natives, suggesting that 50 men would be all that's required to hold the island. There is nothing about governing them as he pleases. What are you talking about? Subjugate and conquer are synonymous. Have you never heard of a synonym? What, does subjugation sound friendlier to you than conquer? And that's what the natives were. Peasants, not slaves. Columbus wanted to subjugate them, which means turn them into subjects of the crown, not enslave them. They were forced to work against their will, but nobody owned them. Nobody could buy or sell them. If a requirement for a slave is to be bought and sold, then that leads to absurd conclusions, since it leaves out slave breeding and the stealing of slaves, although they share the same characteristics of the slave being bought and sold notably forced labor. According to Knowing Better, Cervantes wasn't a slave and his master wasn't a slave owner since he wasn't bought and sold. But let's accept his definition. His claim that the Indians were never bought and sold does not comport with the facts. Michele de Cuneo gives us a detailed account of the Diano slave trade, which Knowing Better left out. According to Michele, 1,600 Indians were gathered up. The Spanish picked 550 of what they considered were the Indians' cream of the crop and loaded them up into caravels. The majority of Indians were supplied to everyone at the settlement. After everyone was supplied, approximately 400 remained and were permitted to freely roam around the area. Their captors included, quote, one of their kings with two principal men, unquote. It was decided that they would be executed with arrows the following day so they were shackled, but at night they gnawed one another's heels with their teeth so that they could escape from the shackles and flee. During their trip from Hispaniola to Spain, approximately 200 Indians died, and the ones that died were thrown overboard. When they made it to Spain, Juan Fonseca put the survivors up for sale in Seville. The Spanish chronicler Bernadez noted that, quote, naked as they they were born with no more embarrassment than wild beasts. They were not very profitable since almost all died, for the country did not agree with them." Unquote. It seems like Michele de Cuneo did not believe that the Indians should be slaves, stating that, quote, For your information, they are not men made for work, and they fear greatly the cold, and do not live long. Did Christopher Columbus share the same sentiment? No. In a 1498 letter to the Spanish monarchs, he stated that, quote, We can send from here in the name of the Holy Trinity all the slaves in Brazil would that can be sold. If my information is correct, one can sell 4,000 slaves that would bring in at least 20 million maravedes, and I believe that my 
my information is correct, for in Castille, in Aragon, and Italy, and Sicily, and the islands of Portugal, and the Canary Islands, they use up many slaves, and the number of slaves coming from Guinea is diminishing, and although the Indian slaves tend to die off now, this will not always be the case, for the same thing used to happen with the slaves from Africa and the Canary Islands." Unquote. I could go on, but I think that sufficiently refutes your nonsensical argument and I don't feel like beating up a dead horse. Furthermore, the encomienda did not legally start until the 16th century. Before that, Christopher Columbus and his cavalry were already terrorizing the island of Hispaniola. Columbus was removed as governor of Hispaniola in 1500 and put in jail. Not because of his brutal treatment of the natives, but because of his mismanagement of the colony, which meant that he wasn't extracting enough gold, and because of complaints from the Spanish colonists. I love how he leaves out crucial information that shows how dishonest he really is. Remember when he said that the Indians were never slaves? In October 1498, five ships returned to Spain with Spanish colonialists and around 500 slaves who were given to the Spanish, returning home. That's when Queen Isabella stated, quote, What right does my admiral have to give away my vessels to anyone? Unquote. Then the Spanish launched complaints to the Queen about Columbus, and one of those complaints was that Columbus showed favoritism in distributing the natives to the Spanish. Christopher Columbus wasn't a protector of anyone. He was a homicidal maniac that cared about power and making money. In 1515, Las Casas gave up his encomienda and advocated instead for the use of African slaves. That's right, the protector of the natives, as he would later be called, advocated for the transatlantic slave trade. Ignoring the fact that Las Casas became doubtful of African slavery, and became fearful that because he used black slaves that he would not be absolved at the last day of judgment. His ideas against black African slavery could have influenced the Archbishop of Mexico who became doubtful concerning the legitimacy of black African slavery, and requested that the question be discussed at the Royal Council. Las Casas wasn't a perfect man, but I think you're treating him very unfairly. Chop off people's hands. Cut off people's noses and hands unless they give you silver, right? He was doing that to the Spanish. I'm sure he also did that to the natives, but the king and queen didn't really care about the natives at this point. But his punishment was that he was removed as governor and put in jail for a total of six weeks, after which he was given everything back and sent out on his fourth voyage. So you can see how much they really cared about punishing him. But it was while he was arrested that he wrote an important letter. Girls as young as nine years old were sold into sexual slavery. My customers wanted New World sex slaves, and I heard them. Actual Christopher Columbus quote. That actual Christopher Columbus quote comes from that important letter I just mentioned, where he complains about the robbing and sexual slavery of natives. Which is why he cut off colonists' hands and noses. I think you're confused. Columbus hung the Spanish colonialists. I don't think he ever cut the body parts of the Spanish. That's something that he did to the natives, and it's well known. Columbus hung the Spanish colonialists, and not because of the heinous acts that they committed against the natives, as you falsely stated, but because they were were rebelling against him and his administration due to food shortages and also the measures put against them by Columbus. Christopher Columbus was scared that the natives were gonna rebel. According to Chief Wangaragari, the city of La Navidad was attacked by a Taino chief named Cavano. He claimed that some of the men had died of disease and some in fights with one another over gold and women. Others left to explore the interior and died there, while the rest were killed in the attack. He claimed that Canavo had burned down his own town after he tried to protect the Spaniards, in which he received a wound. But this is where it gets very weird. When the physician Chanka offered to treat it, the physician found no evidence of a wound, and Juan Ganagari left the area abruptly after being questioned by Columbus. 
the Spanish suspected that Wanganagari could have had a role in the massacre. So high-ranking members like Fray Bill wanted Columbus to punish Wanganagari, but Columbus refused, stating that, quote, judging that this is not the moment to irritate the spirit of the natives, unquote. This event caused Christopher Columbus to increase the constructions of principal buildings, water mills, and town walls, as well as the planting of the crops in the fort of La Isabella by ordering the nobility to work and by using the nobility's horses to aid in the construction. This caused the initial rebellion led by Pisa which was crushed by Columbus and led to the hangings of multiple Spaniards. And if Christopher Columbus was such a protector of the Indians by punishing the Spanish for the heinous acts they committed against the natives, then why in the same letter you mentioned did Columbus state how the Indians harassed him? The whole letter is a pity party written to one of his supporters in court. And to be honest, Queen Isabella was way more of a protector to the Native Americans than Christopher Columbus. In 1500, she ordered that some of the Indian slaves be sent back home and that Indians shouldn't be slaves but quote-unquote subjects that should be converted to Christianity. Granted, that only seemed to apply to slaves brought back by Christopher Columbus because she did not seem to care when Ojeda and Amerjo brought back slaves to Spain in 1499. And Indian slavery went unchecked for decades in the New World, surviving way past her death. And in 1503, she created a decree that anyone under her orders might try to bring the supposed cannibals to her service and faith. If failing, they could capture the so-called cannibals and take them to other places and sell them. So she gave the Spanish powers equivalent to Shazam. Except when Billy Bat says Shazam, he turns into a superhero. But when a Spaniard said cannibal, the Indians are able to be sold for money by the Spanish. So I'm not romanticizing her, but she's way ahead of Columbus for the title of protector of the Indians. Am I saying that Columbus was a good person? No. But am I saying that he was against the very thing that people say he was for? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. They're quoting his complaint about something happening and saying he was doing it. That's... Talk about taking something out of context. Talk about taking something out of context. It's laughable because you're being just as dishonest. You're stating that Columbus violently punished the Spanish as a result of their acts against the natives, which is false. You are also trying to use mental gymnastics to claim that the natives weren't slaves when they clearly were by any reasonable definition. You also tried to refute scholarly translations by using Google Translate, and when it stated the same thing with grammatical errors, you continued claiming that the translation were misrepresenting Columbus. The translations are not at all misrepresenting what Columbus said, and your own source has an English translation that states the same thing. Everybody agrees with one another, but you had to scour the internet for an Italian translation that confirms your bias. If your problem is with people interpreting the word servant to mean slave and not servant to God, then you should have confined your criticism to them and not try to go on this failed refutation of scholarly sources. That's the instance you expose yourself to me. You expose yourself as not being able to control your biases and allowing it to affect your conclusions. Las Casas had already given up his encomienda and started the slave trade by the time he transcribed Columbus's journal. Please, Las Casas did not start the slave trade. That's nonsense. So at this point, he has every incentive to make Columbus look as bad as possible. It's laughable because some detractors of Las Casas claim that he had a bias for Columbus because he was a family friend, and now you're saying that he has an incentive to make Christopher Columbus seem worse than he was. Excuse me, but Las Casas was one of the most reliable historians of that time. When he paraphrased something, he stated that it was a paraphrase. When he quoted something, he stated that it was a quote. And he didn't exaggerate anything to my knowledge. Those are claims made by his detractors to try to paint him as unreliable. 
In fact, it's common knowledge that he paraphrased and exaggerated. This is made even worse by Black Legend, which is a propaganda campaign by English historians to make the Spanish look much worse than they really were. It is in common knowledge, and actually in your own Wikipedia source, it clearly states that, quote, Today, the degree to which Las Casas' descriptions of Spanish colonialization represent a reasonable or wildly exaggerated picture is still debated among some scholars, unquote. I agree that it's still debated, but by scholars that care about the truth and authoritarian scholars that try to romanticize an empire. What's funny about the black legend is that its scholars claim that propagandists from England, France, Germany, Italy, and the Netherlands vilify the Spanish by portraying them as evil and cruel. So who do they go out and attack? A Spanish historian in Las Casas with claims of exaggeration. But the arguments they make against Las Casas aren't good or are in contradiction to other sources that backs up Las Casas. For example, the historian Menendez Bedad denounces Las Casas' claim of exhausted Indian carriers chained by the neck whose heads the Spaniards severed from their bodies so they might not have to stop to untie them as imagination. But this practice is backed by other sources such as Judge Alonso de Zorita and Cesar de Leon. In fact, Spanish scholar Jimenez Fernandez concluded that the facts cited by Las Casas were in great part drawn from reports submitted to the Spanish monarchs and the Council of the Indies. So when people say from Columbus's own journals, what they really mean is from one specific 1892 English translation of the 1530 transcripts of Columbus's journals, originally written 40 years earlier. I hate to draw this comparison, but it's kind of like directly quoting Jesus. He didn't speak English what you're actually reading is a centuries-old translation of a third-person account of what he said written hundreds of years afterwards. Uh, that's not at all the same. Las Casas transcripted a direct copy of Columbus's actual journal. While the Gospels were written in Greek with dubious origins, possibly from an earlier document based on oral tradition. And there isn't only a black legend when it comes to this topic. There's a black legend when it comes to the Spanish Inquisition position, for example, and why didn't you mention the white legend? Okay, something else that really stuck out to me is that 200 number. No matter what source you look up, you'll see the 1542 population numbers around 2,000 to 5,000, which is still small, don't get me wrong, but it's 10 to 25 times larger than what Adam says. So where did he get this? Here. By 1542, there were fewer than 200. But wait a second, did you notice something? Here, Adam says that the Taino population in 1492 was 250,000, which is pretty accurate to what most everyone else says. But in Adam's source, it says the population was 1.1 million, which is ridiculous. What's ridiculous is that these low counters love to drastically underestimate the population of Hispaniola in 1492 and say that it was 250,000. What's ridiculous is that these same people completely ignore the unfinished census that was taken in 1496, which was mentioned by multiple sources such as Las Casas. It's completely dishonest to ignore this unfinished census, but there's a good reason why low counters do ignore it. The unfinished census estimates a total of 1.13 million natives in 1496. Problem is that the census does not take into account the natives that were uncounted or those that were children or the elderly. Tributes were imposed on those 14 years of age and older. Children is defined as a person younger than 14. And the elderly are those too old to work and could not be expected to give a tribute. When Columbus implemented his oppressive tribute system on the natives, he gave them tokens that the natives had to wear around their necks to prove that they paid their tribute tax. The tribute was organized through casites, or native leaders who were responsible for its collection and deliverance. Natives that were found without this necklace were punished. Using the Bora Cook method, since the census took into account half the island of able-bodied natives, multiply 1.13 million by 2 to estimate the total population of able-bodied natives, which would be around 2.26 million. Since the other half would have been uncontacted, the natives from the uncontacted side would have been less affected by diseases and heinous acts by the Spanish. 
thus the number of children and the elderly would have been at relatively normal numbers. Based on Bora Cook's studies from pre-Columbian native populations, children and the elderly would have made up about 45% of the total population, and in the contacted areas due to diseases and heinous acts, that number would have been significantly less, which could be at 35%. Average out the two percentages and you get 40%. 2.26 million would have made 60% of the population since 100% minus 40% equals 60%, which remember 40% represents the children and the elderly, while 100% of course represents the total Taino population. Divide 2.26 million by 60% and you get an approximation of 3,766,667 total Tainos as a midpoint estimate. Using logarithmic extrapolation, here are the numbers of the total Taino population starting at 1492. Furthermore, most scholars have the population larger than 250,000 as shown here. The reason I use the Bora Cook method is because Bora and Cooks are pioneers when it comes to demographic estimation of pre Columbian native populations. And they include the 1496 census, which many scholars unjustly ignore, with nonsensical claims that Columbus had an incentive to inflate the numbers. The 1496 census was taken to estimate the amount of tributes. Tributes were based on headcounts which is why Columbus ordered his brother to take the census to estimate the amount of tributes that would be paid. Thus, an overestimation of the population would lead to an overestimation of the tributes paid and therefore a higher royal tax. Furthermore, even if you accept the claim that Columbus inflated the population numbers as true, the census, especially taken at a short amount of time, would have been dependent on native leaders' records, which would have an incentive to underestimate the population, counteracting Columbus's supposed inflation of the numbers. Two of these low counters are David Hine and Angel Rosenblatt. They try to bring in doubt about the sources by misrepresenting the sources by taking something from the source that has nothing to do with the population count to justify their claims of exaggeration. For example, Angel Rosenblatt stated that Las Casas was a victim of Columbus's illusion. He supports this claim by misquoting Las Casas. He stated that Las Casas calculated the size of England using claims of Julius Caesar, Pliny, Bede, San Isidore de Savia, Solisis, and Diodorus. This isn't really accurate. Las Casas mentions the sources for the estimation of England and calls all of them false except for Caesar's estimation which implies that he's in agreement with Caesar's 650 leagues estimation of England's circuit. He rejects Pliny, Bede, San Isidore de Savia, Solisis, and Diodorus on the basis that their estimates do not comport with empirical evidence of that time. This is mostly trivial. The main problem is when Rosenblitz states, quote, on the other hand of Hispaniola, he reported, the admiral who had sailed or gone all the way around said that it was 700 leagues around, so that this island is wider and larger than England, or at least, to be honest, it is not smaller. Unquote. Here Rosenblatt is trying to make it seem as if Las Casas blindly accepted Columbus's estimation of the island of Hispaniola. But Rosenblatt forgot to mention that before Las Casas even mentions Columbus's estimation, he mentions an initial estimate which estimates the length of Hispaniola to be 145 leagues with a width of 80 leagues or at least 70 leagues. In the initial estimation, measures the circuit of the island to be of 600 leagues. And even though both estimates got it wrong, I don't think it's an exaggeration since that implies an intent to misrepresent. It's simply an overestimation which is common in the search for truth. And estimating the length and width of an island is not the same as estimating a population.
population which requires natural numbers and basic arithmetic. Las Casas' objectivity is shown by the simple fact that he included the initial estimate along with Columbus's estimate. If he wasn't objective, he could have simply left that estimate out, which actually shows Hispaniola to be smaller than Caesar's estimate of England's circuit. And he simply could have just mentioned Columbus's estimate, which shows Hispaniola to be bigger than Caesar's estimation of England. In 2012, George Zimmerman shot and killed Trayvon Martin. That fact is beyond dispute, but he was found innocent. How is that possible? Because he was tried for murder, not manslaughter. Murder requires an intent to kill. Zimmerman didn't leave his house that morning saying, I'm gonna kill a black kid today. Completely ignoring that at that time in Florida, prosecutors had to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. You're also ignoring racial bias that exists in the judicial system. And murder can have nothing to do with quote-unquote intent. You never heard of murder in the second degree, which was what Zimmerman was charged with. The intent is what matters. So when we look at what happened with Columbus and his men, there's no denying that mass killings took place. I am not trying to deny, excuse, or minimize what happened. But when trying to label the crime as genocide, we have to look at the intent. Genocide, as defined by the UN, is an act committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. Intent? And what type of intent are you talking about? Dolus specialis, dolus eventualis, general or knowledge-based intent? Dolus specialis has been widely accepted as the definition for intent in the Genocide Convention, but as more trials have taken place, this interpretation interpretation of intent has been called into question. The Dolus Specialis interpretation of intent goes against the drafters of the Genocide Convention, specifically Raphael Lemkin, who focus on the idea of a group being destroyed and not the level of intention behind the perpetrator's actions. The International Court would be hard-pressed to convict Columbus if we use the Dolus Specialis interpretation of intent, but the likelihood of Columbus being convicted increases if we use the knowledge-based approach of intent which is more in line with the drafters of the Genocide Convention. Truth is that Columbus and his imagined female goddess form Columbia have been part of the American story since the beginning. Here she is telling you to ration food during World War I, and here she is in the painting that you all know, even if you're not American, as the depiction of Manifest Destiny. Admittedly, American folklore has probably turned him into a bigger deal than he should be given his rather minimal involvement in US history, which is why I personally don't think that we should have a day to celebrate him. But conversely, I also disagree with just renaming it Indigenous People's Day, because what is it really? Ah, uh, f*** yeah. Yeah, f*** Columbus. F*** Christopher Columbus. That's a big f*** you. It's just anti-Columbus Day. Think about it, what do people do on Indigenous People's Day? They hate Columbus, burn him in effigy, and hold mock trials of him. If you want to have a day where we celebrate native history and native cultures, then let's do that. Don't just name swap it and make it hate on Columbus Day. We don't have a day where we hate on objectively more evil people like- Uh, Indigenous People's Day is going to be inherently anti-Columbus, especially since it was created as a counter to Columbus Day. Complaining that Indigenous his People's Day is anti-Columbus is like complaining that the remembrance of the victims of the Holocaust is anti-Hitler. And I doubt that all people do on Indigenous People's Day is mock Columbus. I think you're using those instances to hide behind the fact that you don't want an Indigenous People's Day. And Columbus is not just an individual. He's a symbol. He represents something. He's a symbol for colonialism, and he simply represents the negation of the native people. So if you're going to have Indigenous Peoples Day, you can expect that people, especially indigenous people, are going to reject that symbol, especially in a country that uses Christopher Columbus as a symbol, as you just shown, to represent manifest destiny, which is racist bullshit. Thank you.